It might be known for rock, ballroom dancing, arcades, and even the Cure's Robert Smith. But one wouldn't automatically think of Blackpool, England as the home of Sweet Mash. Thanks to the efforts of our guest today, you will now. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time. Moving from New York City to Blackpool, England is only a small step if your goal is to redefine what an English whiskey can be. Vince Olson, our guest today and distillery manager of Bank Hall Sweet Mash, has taken that step. He is bourbon bent and hell bound to co op the title of the famous song by Hank Williams Jr. Although on their way to having liquid in the barrel for three years in oak casks, Bank Hall Sweet Mash was just too good not to share. Vince is here with me today to chat what makes it so good and what will be waiting for us when those three years are over already. FYI, we do say whiskey and bourbon interchangeably in the app when talking about Bank Hall, but it is a Sweet Mash bourbon style liquid technically. Now, on to Vince. So on your LinkedIn profile, it says bourbon bent and hell bound. Now, I know that's taken from a Hank Williams Jr. song. So since we're about to talk about Sweet Mash, give me a little intro into Vince Olson, why you are bourbon bent and hell bound, and yeah. where this love of our dark spirit came from. I love that quote just because I feel like I don't take myself too seriously. I am a bit irreverent. I think that shows up in our spirits here at Bank Hall for sure. The passion for whiskey, though, or my, my drive for dark spirits, I would say maybe started when I was a little kid. My grandma was telling me about her St. Bernard. I was born in Denver, Colorado, but I kind of grew up between Phoenix, Arizona and Denver, Colorado. And I was learning about my grandmother's St. Bernard up in the mountains of Denver in a little town called well, outside of Boulder. And it was just so fascinating, this idea of this dog with this barrel of whiskey around its neck that would like rescue people that were lost in the blizzards and that the whiskey would somehow let them survive. I was just fascinated from a, from a very young age about whiskey. Fast forward to turned 19 in Arizona and I was playing in a rock band and I really wanted to get into bartending. And I just sort of fell into the world of bars by way of music. But luckily, I had this kind of connection with the bar owners because I was playing in a band. Otherwise, I definitely would not have been able to get a job at a bar as a bartender at 19. So now, what did you play? Oh, I was the lead singer, but I also play guitar and would help write the, write the songs with the rest of the band. And what was the band called? Uh, <laughs> it's old. This is old, old stuff. So I think I actually think we might be on Spotify somewhere. It's called Vistalance, V-I-S-T-A-L-A-N-C-E. But this is not a plug for that band. We broke up a long time ago. Best, <laughs> best times. I had the best times. Taught me a lot about running your business being in a band is like having four other business partners you know or, or girlfriends boyfriends whatever so that definitely was a good experience to learn you know right after this interview i'm totally going to go to spotify and check it out gosh i was not prepared for this <laughs> <laughs> and it's gonna you, you never know if you give me the rights to it it may be the music that accompanies this podcast oh. all right back to your adventures in bartending or trying to bartend at 19. Well, yeah, so I actually went to bartending school, which makes me ob obviously is the highest level of uh, achievement you can you can get in life as a bartender. Went to bartending college, I think it was called. Oh my god, I mean, once I actually became a bartender, you realize how big of a joke it is, but you know, <laughs> respect to whoever's doing it because it does give you a tiny bit of confidence and a tiny bit of knowledge. So, I did this almost just like, I swear it was just to like tick the box of the bar owner, just that I had some knowledge, but ultimately he was going to hire me either way. So I got in and I just really fell in love with the whole atmosphere of the drinks industry that, I mean, obviously I'd been around it, playing in a band. I wasn't of drinking age yet. I was 19 
18, 19 at the time. But I remember the first night I worked a real shift. I left and the bar manager had to chase me down in the parking lot to say, here's your money. And I was like, oh, I got paid to do that. That was amazing. So it's always been uh, a huge part of my life. And listening to some of your other episodes, I was like, oh, this is really kind of serendipitous because bartending, which is a common thread for a lot of your episodes, I thought was really cool for me to kind of talk about that with you a little bit. So, um, no, absolutely. Now, when you were of drinking age, should we say, sure, were you a whiskey drinker? Or were you more of a beer drinker? I definitely dabbled in a lot of whiskey. Um, sorry, in, in a lot of different kinds of spirits. I, I don't think I really started to appreciate whiskey, though, until I eventually took over as bar manager at that bar in um, downtown Phoenix. So that's where I first started working. It was a venue bar, so it was really cool. I got to see live music and bartend. And it was basically just slinging drinks, like basic stuff. I didn't really actually appreciate the art of bartending. Not that there's any high form of bartending or low form of bartending per se, but I think there is a difference between a well-crafted cocktail and a Jack and Coke. No offense. So we were no mixology. No mixology. We're just, we're mixing rum and Cokes, getting stuff out fast. Yes. It's all about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh So anyways, I think I fell in love with whiskey though, or really started opening my eyes to whiskey when I first tried a single barrel whiskey. And the person that came in to share this whiskey with me really showcased how each individual barrel has each has individual, you know, profile, different aromas, different, different notes, different flavors that might emerge from each cask. And I thought that that was just so magical. And that really sort of piqued my interest yet again into whiskey. And so when I continued my career as a bartender. I started leaning more and more toward whiskey focused bars and endeavors. So fast forward to my journey to New York. So I I lived in Phoenix for a while, bartended. It had always been this like backbone for me that allowed me to be more brave in life, you know, because you could always fall back on bartending no matter what. So I feel for all my bartenders out there right now because it's like, it must be, it must be such a hard time. And I really do feel for Mm -hmm. them. But I think it will come around again and it will be this, the, the career path that will always open doors for you. But anyways. Well, wait a sec. Were you studying something at university while bartending that you thought, okay, I'm going to do this and I could fall back on bartending? Sure. Yeah. And it's funny because bartending and it took me way further than my studies ever did. I studied at Arizona State University a little bit. I just, the path at the time was not clear in front of me at okay. all. And so... I was taking all these different classes and I just didn't really see them turning into something. It was like, I was thinking I had a communications degree or the start of it. That's what I was, that was my career path. That's how general I was. And it just didn't seem like it was going to take me somewhere that I wanted to go at that time in my life. So I literally one day just stood up in the middle of some anthropology class and I just removed myself from the whole, the whole process. I just and went back to the bar and went back to bartending. Yeah, Um, which is always a good place to go. I I I think it was a wise move actually for me at the Uh time. I really do. But well, Arizona is so beautiful. It's one of my favorite states. What made you come east? Well, I think New York for me always was this place like in the movies. You know, like I'd never really thought I would live there, but this opportunity arose. One of my best friends moved there and let let me crash on her couch. Well, well two of my, my best friends, they sisters, they let me crash on their couch in Brooklyn for, well, I was looking for a job quote for the first month, but really just partying with them in Brooklyn and all over Manhattan and eventually did find a job as a bartender, which is so, so hard because in order to have a job as a New York City bartender, you have to have experience in New York City. But uh-huh. how do you get New York City experience? Of unless, so, Anyways. Eventually, somebody gave me a shot at a whiskey bar, and that sort of continued this progression for me. Did you fall more and more in love with whiskey while you were at the whiskey bar, thinking this could be my life, whiskey? I, I, I was, I wasn't sure. I was at this time in my life where I was like, I was overwhelmed with all these different creators in New York City. It was a very, it was a much more artisanal culture than I was used to in Arizona at the time, which I think Phoenix has traveled a long way since. 
but in Colorado at Denver and Phoenix at both a little bit more like cookie cutter corporate takeover. It's changed in both cities quite a bit since then, but in Brooklyn, it was, and in New York in general, it was just this like revolution of people that were doing things with their hands. And there's like a boat workshop down the street from this place that I would go. And there was like all these artists I was in, in, interested in. And so I started just like getting really passionate about the other elements of behind bartending. So how does the wine get made? How does the beer get made? And started this journey where I was really just passionate about all the different little elements. I even went to shadow at Amy's Bread to watch how they fed their yeast mother and like toured the whole bakery. Just, just like by myself. I was just like, I want to know these things. I got a notification or just my friend, an old school Uh notification, tapped me on my shoulder and Uh said, hey, there's an ad on Craigslist for a assistant distiller at Widow Jane, which was a distillery I was pretty interested in. And I sort of just kind of fell in love with this story of this water from this limestone mine in Rosendale and how they blended it with their whiskey. I thought that was super cool. And the fact that they were right there in New York, I was like, this is so awesome. I showed up for the interview, which is really just get to work. (laughs) Assistant distiller, which was a really fancy title for box maker. And so I just dove right in and I was like, cool. I don't care what it takes. I just want to be a part of this. So I just started making boxes, helping with bottling everything that needed to get done. I was just doing it. And about a week later, maybe two weeks later, the uh, owner at the time, he came up and he's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm just going to keep coming till you guys hire, till you guys hire me. And they put me on payroll. So they had no idea that you weren't actually hired. No. Into- <laughs> well, well, I mean, I don't think he did. You know, uh-huh. I mean, he was, um, bless him. He was involved in some things, but not everything at the time. And, you know, he just kept seeing me. I think he just saw my energy and was like, oh, who is this guy? I think we need him in our, in the business. So, um, I'm really grateful for that. They gave me a shot and I, uh, I, n- I never took it for granted. I, uh, I really did just give that place a hundred percent. I was still bartending at the time, which became so hard for me. I was, I was bartending nights and then getting up a few hours later to start the distillery some mornings. So that was really when I needed to make a decision about which path I wanted to choose. So bartending, not that I didn't still love it, but this path into whiskey just seems like had a lot more adventure. And so that was the path I chose. And I really buckled down and just started diving into all the different things that Widow Jane had to offer at the time, which was a ton, which was, you know, learning about all of the mashing and fermentation and distillation, the barreling, the brand ambassador side of things as well. So going out into the, into the world and just talking to people about what we do and what we did. And that just kind of created a spark and I eventually was able to take over, which so funny. I started as a box maker and I took over as head distiller. So it was quite a journey. And all the while, this brand was just growing and growing. So I'm just really, really grateful that I had that opportunity with them. They are still growing to this day and I wish them all the best, truly. But it came to a point where I felt like there was more opportunity for me if I, you know, if I was going to really grow as a distiller. I needed to kind of jump from the nest a bit, you know. Well, spread your wings and fly over the pond. Ex- exactly, exactly. <laughs> or down south, I guess. Two <laughs> two kinds of choices, right? <laughs> this is true. I have. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know. I was just going to say, you know, it's interesting that you're in Blackpool because I'm sure, as someone in whiskey. I guess there are these choices that you like, do I go to Kentucky or Tennessee or obviously you can make bourbon anywhere, but, or do I go to Scotland or how do I find my way? So how did you find your way to Blackpool? So Blackpool is kind of funny. It's, it's, it kind of, to me as a ex New Yorker, I lived in New York for nine years. So I try to just compare everything to New York. It's, oh, I lived there too for a long time before yeah, London. I'm sure well. you understand. Um, uh-huh. so. To me, Blackpool kind of feels like the Coney Island of Manchester. And it actually has this weird little bit of history of that where people would go 
to Blackpool to, you know, ha- have vacations and things before European travel became so much easier. You know, they would want to, they would stay in England. And so they would go from Manchester or Liverpool or maybe Preston or, you know, surrounding even actually, even Scots would come down here. Those in Scotland, north of the border, right. uh-huh. they would come down here as well. So there's this like fond memory that a lot of people have of Blackpool, but it's in recent years because it, the tourism industry has dried up a little bit in terms of local tourism. We're really happy to be here helping to bring a, you know, po- po- positive new image to this area. I mean, we're in this little bit of a industrial section here and we're, we wear the fact that we're in Blackpool, right on all of our shirts and on the front of the building, you know, we want to represent it. We're not trying to hide from it. We really want to wear it and let, let Blackpool know that we're happy to be here. We brought a bunch of jobs into this, into this business or into this distillery. I mean, you could see behind there's all of our babies resting back there. Yeah, yeah, um, I see. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's really exciting, but I don't think I answered your question. So the trip for me to get to Blackpool, it was an opportunity that was, I think it was originally sort of packaged as this, let's do a bourbon style whiskey in England. And I only say whiskey like that because it, our, our product isn't quite whiskey yet. It, it's not three right. years old, which is funny because back where I'm from, it's whiskey the day it goes in the barrel. But uh-huh. here it's got to be three years and a yep. day old. So right now what we have is spirit that's in the bottle behind me, the bottle, the bottle behind you as well. Um, grain spirit. We try to be really upfront about that. I mean, of course. it feels like a whiskey. It drinks like a whiskey. I mean, it, 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 for all intents and purposes, is a whiskey, but it's not a whiskey by name yet. And we're not legally allowed to call it a whiskey. Before we get into bank hall, sure. was there a bank hall before you came to do it? Or was it this proposition to create something that was then going to be bank hall? So, yeah, that was well, it's so a chicken there, and egg thing. I know, I know. There was an original bank hall. And so we allude to that on the bottle. There's a, there's a little nod to it. 1790 is when the original bank hall distillery was operating in Liverpool, actually. And they were a massive operation making millions and millions of liters of alcohol per year. I think they made over 5 million liters of pure alcohol per year, which is just crazy. Was it just, was it just neutral spirit or what, what was it? They would make more of a, like a neutral whiskey, almost like a grain whiskey, which is funny. That's kind of also, we do what would be called a grain whiskey as well on our tax returns. We call it a grain whiskey because it's not a malt whiskey, which is what so many other whiskeys are in the UK. But they, they also did some malt whiskey as well. So I, I, I don't know if it was like a proper single malt. The records are a bit hazy on that, but they had malt based whiskeys and corn based whiskeys as well which is a cool little yeah. nod to what we do now. But I think the thing that really drew me in to this distillery and to helping come over here and create this, obviously the opportunity is amazing to build a distillery from the ground up, but also to help redefine what English whiskey is. And I think there's so much more that can be said for the English whiskey category. There's li- really the sky's the limit in England. It just has to be made from grain, aged in a barrel, and three years in a day. You can do anything else. And I think what we want to do is help change the conversation. What I'm most excited about in this project, and what took me from Brooklyn to England, was this opportunity to help redefine what English whiskey is. That You know, it's a pretty sexy opportunity for someone to um, say, come from Brooklyn to Blackpool to redefine English whiskey. I would take that up too. I mean, it, it, you must have jumped at the chance. So what what did you jump into? So there was bank call from 1790s. And so when you got there kind of the first day, quote unquote, first days, uh, was it really right from the beginning or were they already re- creating spirits? So we were dabbling with the idea of sourcing some liquid to get us started. Widow Jane did a lot of that. And so I was very familiar with it, but I'm really glad we went the option of choosing to make everything in house. I think it gives us a lot more integrity to stand with. And so when we started the project, the first day one was like, let's actually make sure all of our equipment will work properly. And we were still in this phase where we were piping it all in when I got here. 
Um, so I actually got to, you know, help choose where some of the routes went and what would make the most sense. Cause a lot of it was being done by engineers and I love engineers, but distillers, when you're actually using things, you're going to know that you want this to go this way and this to go this way. So being a part of that, learning how to read a PNID, which is a piping and instrumentation diagram. I had no idea what that was before I moved over here and just you know, diving into the engineering side working with contractors, learning all these things in the UK. I mean, it was, it was a blur. It was crazy. And I was in way over my head, but I think that's the only way you really grow is if you put yourself in situations where you have to grow. So yeah, I'm still, I'm still a bit uh, amazed that we got this thing off the ground and are now looking back on it. We're now at two years, a little over two years. We first, we first started distilling on March of 2020 which is a really weird time to get a distillery up and running. Um, oh my goodness. I know but, what you did lockdown. Well, we, <laughs> created a distillery. Now, uh, how about the ingredients and what your recipe was going to be? Was that already decided or mm. you created that? So there were some initial ideas about what the distillery would be, but we very much were changing a lot of this as we went along to suit the, you know, UK, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the, the kit that's built in this country and the the processes in this country are quite a bit different than they are in the U.S. And so what we had to do is be kind of ingenious and develop some hybrid systems that would allow us to actually process whole grains, which is what you do with bourbon. Most everybody else in the U.K. will take their grains and leave them behind. And so they're just left with the liquid, which is called a wart or a wash. But we deal with a full mash. And so that a lot of complications revolving around d doing that for the first time, really, in this country. For a lot of people that we work with, a lot of our suppliers, they're like, you're doing what? It's, hold on, why are the grains in the mix? No, no, it's supposed to be there. And then working with local farmers to get the grains that we want as well. We are still, we're close. We're close for getting our corn from the UK. We get our malt and our rye from the UK, or the malted barley and the rye from the UK. And we also get wheat. We get wheat from the UK as well. But for the sake of quality, which is really important to us, because we really want these ingredients shine, the corn, which is the backbone of any bourbon or bourbon style, that we get the highest quality from France, actually. So oh. that is what's shipped in from France to make sure that we have a high quality maize or corn to work with on all of our recipes, but the rest of them are local. And once we get to a point where we can sustainably get high quality corn in the UK, we'll do that as well. Uh, there's actually some crop this year that might actually be viable. So we're really excited about, or I'm really excited about that. I'm, there's some, some of my team is too, of course. So I have a question then. If, well, are, are you then looking to keep doing this style of sweet mash and again we're using our quotes even though no one can see our fingers <laughs> or are you going to because you're so new or is is liquid in barrels waiting to become either a bourbon or whiskey so yes uh i, I mean i think some of that some of the answer to that question depends a little bit on the uptake of sweet mash in the market we definitely are still new. We just released it in October and then routes to market or the distribution points, as they call it here in the UK, route to market. Those are just opening up now. And it's a weird time to release a whiskey in October because then Christmas time and everything. So we're still very much in the process of like launching it in a real way. And so if it does really, really well, we might, but I think my, myself and our master blender, Kirsty McCallum, we both would love to phase out the grain spirit and phase in our whiskey, proper whiskey, once it gets to three years old. And I, I think that's probably the route we'll take. But if people really love this young whiskey, quote unquote whiskey, this young grain spirit, then we may continue making it. It's kind of up to the, to the marketplace. You know, I can see the future. I can see what's going to happen. Oh, yeah. You guys are going to stop making it. And then in 10 years, it's going to be sold for tens of thousands on the market. I better stop drinking mine because it is absolutely delicious. You can see I've earned, this is me. I finished like half the bottle already. I just couldn't wait. I'm a big fan of bourbon style or bur I am a big fan of bourbon. And I just found this so easy to drink. It's, 
it works amazing in an old fashioned. And I just can't see how it can get better, really. It is just really, really delicious. How long did it take you to get this? I mean, to, to, to really, to, to, till it's, it was good enough to bottle. Well, I, the audio won't show how much I'm blushing right now. It seriously is a huge compliment. (laughs) Thank you. We are really, really proud of that liquid. And I mean, uh, it's nine months old. So we're just, we can't wait to share with people when it gets even older and when we first release our, our whiskey. But that was quite a few batches of just playing around with the ratio of grain. And we started off with a high corn content of our, of our mash bill. We then started playing around because we do. So we've got these traditional pot stills. They're gorgeous. They're from Macmillan. They're Scottish coppersmiths doing it for hundreds of years. They're amazing. So we've got three pot stills. And so we wanted to nod to that a little bit at first and have a high malt recipe, but it just wasn't as good as our high rye recipe. So it was a bit of trial and error. I think by the time we got to maybe our 36th batch of bourbon or so, our 36th barrel of bourbon, sorry, I should say. Um, So that would have been quite a few batches before that, that we actually were executing to to make the mash and then distill it. And we have to distill it three times, which gives us a really cool profile and makes, I think, you know, sets our whiskey apart a little bit from, from other bourbon whiskeys. Of course, Woodford hats off to them for being, I think the first (laughs) triple distilled, but I think there's room in the marketplace for more than one triple distilled bourbon. So the 36th barrel of whiskey that we put down I think is when it really came into view. And so that is a collection of whiskey that is right around that same high rye recipe. One thing we're super upfront about everything that we do here, but just one thing that we don't disclose is our mash bill. And I know it drives some people crazy. And I know there's some like bourbon whiskey nerds that will forever hound us on this, but mostly just to watch them squirm we're not going to say our mash bills. So we'll give you the general breakdown, but I don't think you really need to know if it's 17% or 18%. I don't think it really matters that much. As long as you know the second grain in the recipe, I think that's all that really matters. So the second grain, we're happy to say, and we even put it right on the label there, corn, rye, and malt. So yeah, everyone else could, they they can make it up. But so why did you decide to release a bottle at nine months. Did you just taste it and go, oh my God, this has to be out there. People have to be drinking this. I can't believe it's so good. Yeah, it was actually, we released the bottle at seven months even, which was our very, very first release. We pretty much did it distillery only. It was called Rebellion. I don't know why I'm doing quotes. It was called Rebellion, (laughs) but it was a fun little release that we did only here at the distillery. Really, we released it at um, 47.6%, which is a cool little nod to 4th of July, 1776. Ah. And we did it with the red, white, and blue package. It was fun. It was just fun. But even that, we really just liked where the whiskey was going and or the green spirit was going, I should right. say. And uh, I will say the word whiskey from time to time. You'll have to forgive me. But I, I hope everybody knows my intentions here. Uh, not to mislead at all. But the uh, sweet mash that was something we knew we were going to release even when we put the rebellion out there and just wanting to get people behind what we're doing and showcase how exciting this project is and letting people kind of peek behind the curtain before we have our proper whiskey i think is a really cool way to bring people along on this adventure with us i mean our our tagline is adventures in distilling, which we love here at the distillery because it gives a sort of carte, bl- carte blanche to like have a bunch of experimental recipes, which is really a distiller's dream. Um, so it's really fun to have that. But also we, we, we believe in it. Like we really do believe that this, th- this product is an adventure. This, this story is an adventure and we want to bring people on this with us. So that, that's why. Back to the story of the brand and it being from the 1700s, from Liverpool, Bank Hall. Why or the desire to bring that back as opposed to just create a new name and a new story? Well, that's that's a really good question. I I think the desire to have a nod to the past, to the history of whiskey making in England with an irreverent look to the future is sort of what we're all about. We definitely love the history of what Bank Hall was and what English whiskey making was, but we we very much want to take it in a whole new direction. So I think that it kind of rides that line for us. 
of being old school and new school. And the bottle. Why did you decide on this bottle and you know, making it kind of a slim rectangular bottle and the font and all that stuff? Tell I, me about the bottle creation. I, I, can't, I can't take a lot of credit for that. Honestly, I, I believe it was our CEO, Stuart Ainsworth, who came up with the bottle design. I love it. It's such a cool square bottle. As a bartender, I love that even if you turn it sideways on the shelf to save space, it still says bank hall up the side. Yes, it does. Very, very clever. So I, I would say the higher ups and the uh, design team, they took the project and just pulled it out of creative energy into real life. And then it was up to us because the bottle existed before the whiskey did. So it was a, a <laughs> lot of pressure on us to be like, oh, OK, we got to fill that bottle with something amazing. Now, as a former bartender and as someone who's making this liquid, how did you see it being drunk? I know everyone says, oh, whatever anyone wants to, however anyone wants to drink it. But when you were thinking about it, was it neat or in cocktails or both? Where did you think it would find its home? Well, I am a realist and as a ex venue bartender. And also I kind of skipped over a, a part of my life where I was a hardcore cocktail bartender. I worked at a New Orleans cocktail bar on the Upper East Side. No longer exists, but it was called Infirmary. And if anybody ever get a chance to go there, they will know it was a really killer bar. But that's when I really learned about real cocktail bartending. You know, I, I thought I knew <laughs> and I thought I made cocktails before, but you don't really know the true art of a cocktail until you have to make four Ramos gin fizzes and stir oh Sazeracs while you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, so that that side of me is a bit of a purist and I'm like, oh, we have to express the spirit and it has to be highlighted in the cocktail. On the other hand, I see the English whiskey market and I see when people go out and drink and a lot of people are still mixing their whiskey with Coke and there's no shame in that whatsoever. And so I think for us here, wanting a spirit that could do both, that's a bit tough, but that was the aim. And I think if we, you know, always in the back of my mind, if we got somewhere close to that, it would be still good. And I think it works in a cocktail. I love it in an old fashioned. That's my drink of choice, but I've played around with it in summary drinks this past summer. We were, you know, at home, I was just playing around with different summary drinks, like le lemon based, like bees knees sort of, uh, vert takes. And it works well there. It also works in, in a little bit heavier cocktails like a Manhattan or like a barrel aged old fashioned. We were playing around with doing one here, actually. So I do think it works well in a cocktail as well as just mixed with Coke. And that's yeah, whiskey and Coke whiskey that has to have a lot of personality to compete with the Coke because Coke is, you know, has a pretty strong personality in itself. Yes, I think having it at 46 percent helps. It does stand up in a cocktail a little bit more. It does bring a little bit more of the barrel forward. But I think we have a signature character here at, at the distillery at, at Bank Hall that does shine through, whether the drink is just mixed with soda water, like a whiskey highball, or if it's more complex. So we're really glad that that shines through no matter what. And for, for, for such a high, you know, ABV, it, it, it's really smooth. It's super smooth and young. It's really smooth. I think we can we, I say smooth one more time. The, <laughs> it's super smooth. Well, smooth is what we go. I mean, it's tr triple distilled, you know, yeah, I mean, that yeah. uh, screams smoothness. I, I think the vivacity, the, the youth of the whiskey, the way it was put together in this blend really does help bring the whole experience together. You know, so you have uh, the strength of the sweet mash at 46 percent and all the barrel character that comes with that. But also the vibrancy of the young corn spirit, a little bit of rye and, and, and barley in there as well. All of it just works really harmoniously and does present really well. So we plan to continue this wheat mash line until we have a whiskey. And then once we get to the, the whiskey mark, it'll actually be a single malt that'll be our first whiskey. So I'm really excited for that as well, to introduce a single malt into such a deeply rich single malt community here in the UK. We are a little nervous, if we're honest, but we do, we are very proud of our single malt. Very, very proud of it. That'll be fun in 2023. Our first actual whiskey will end up being a single malt.
That I am really excited for that. <laughs> well, I'll make sure you get a bottle. 2023. I'll make sure you get well, we, We're just now 2022. So, but at least it gives us something to look forward to in some, in, in these dark <laughs> days, I guess, of, of the beginning of 2022. Well, I haven't, Go I was ahead. just, you know, having a, a thought. We haven't, I haven't run this by anybody above me yet, but we're just looking at the stocks this morning and we could put a rye out this year. And I think it would be pretty cool. It still won't be a whiskey. But the cool thing about rye is you can just call it rye and people kind of get it. You know, it'll still be grain spirit. It'll only be two years old. But a lot of rye in the world is two years old. You know, I think probably 80 percent of the rye that people drink in the U.S. comes from MGP and is two years old. So mm, I don't know. I, I, it's it's something that we're uh, we're sort of toying with. And then uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But yeah. A lot of exciting things. I love it. I was going to ask you what was going to, what were you going to be planning for in the future? And now we know there's going to be a single malt, a rye. And would you ever think of doing any other spirits like gin or a vodka or anything like that? Or are you set on your dark spirits there? I think dark spirits are the way for us. No gin for us, I don't think. We, we uh, like to be brand. Um, we, we are going to do a peated expression. And we're not sure when we'll release that. It's maybe our favorite spirit that we make. So the general public will be lucky if they get a bottle because we might just drink it all first. But definitely there'll be some fun stuff in, in the future for us. Well, well, I just, I can't wait. I can't wait. Now, I I'll always end by asking a couple questions. And I was wondering if you have any top tips for the home bartender. It can be about bank hall or it can be anything else. For sure. Well, I think for the novice or, you know, someone who's just curious about bartending at home, I would just urge you, if you're listening, just do it. Just dive in. Like, you're going to make something probably ridiculous and too sugary to begin with, uh, but at least it'll be yours. So I say, I say no matter what it is, you know, follow the recipes online, get yourself a little jigger, uh, a measure, and then actually, you know, dive in for other bartenders at home listening that may be a little more advanced, I just want to share a tip because I've listened to a few of your episodes mm -hmm. and I, I think this tip is actually really important because I don't think I actually learned it until I was quite a bit into the bartending game. And that is if, if you're making a drink and it has juice in it, 99% of the time, it's shaken. If you're making a drink and it's just spirits, 99% of the time, it's stirred. Ah, I had no idea. It's it's a really just good rule to work from, if especially if you're at the stage where you're starting to make your own drinks. If you use those just simple two rules, it, it, there are exceptions, of course, to both. But I think in general, you'll have a little bit more confidence with building a new cocktail. And then break Fant those rules if you want. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, how about the last question is, if you could be anywhere drinking anything... Where would that be and what would you drink? I did think about this a bit and I had a, a thousand ideas, but I think I'll paint a picture of Red Hook, Brooklyn, sunset over the cobblestones, sitting down at Fort Defiance and ordering one of the best Irish coffees in the known universe and sipping it with your friends. And then walking over to the Statue of, to look at the Statue of Liberty as the sun sets. That's where I'd be. Oh, that's very romantic. I love that. <laughs> that's fabulous. Maybe next time I'm in New York, I'm going to do that. So I don't know if they're open still right now as a bar. They switched during COVID to a general grocery, but I think they're going to reopen as a bar in the near future. So if you get a chance to definitely look up, look it up first. Don't just go if it's still a grocery store. <laughs> but if well, it has converted to a bar, definitely go. It's amazing. Maybe they sell takeaway um, Irish coffees. I didn't ask when I was just there. So, oh, yeah. We'll have to explore that. It's well, good. listen, really good. it has been so lovely to have you on the show. Thank you so much. As I said, I've downed half a bottle of Bank Call by myself. Not all at one time, obviously. Of but making old fashions with my friends, Bittered Sling, Plum and Root Beer Bitters. Oh, that sounds great. It is. And it, they have been amazing, these old fashions. So I'm going to have to get me another bottle because I know that and, and, and leave it unopened. <laughs> and I know that when you stop making it, I'll have one. Well, 
It's been an absolute pleasure being here. Seriously, thank you for hosting me and just having this forum for people to talk about spirits in this way. Seriously, thank oh, you. Yeah. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much to Vince for being on the program and Bank Hall for sponsoring the transcription for The Hearing Impaired. Time for our cocktail of the week. A classic nod to New York that pairs so well with our conversation. The cocktail of the week is from New York to Blackpool. You'll need 50 mils of Bank Hall Sweet Mash, 25 mils of fresh lemon juice, 15 mils of simple syrup, one egg white, 10 mils of red wine, and two dashes of Angostura bitters. Add the Bank Hall Sweet Mash, lemon juice, simple syrup, and the egg to a shaker. Then close the shaker and shake as hard as you can. Then open the shaker, add the ice, and then shake, shake, shake as hard as you can again. Then strain all that into a rocks glass with one gorgeous piece of ice. Then take your red wine and take your bar spoon and slowly pour the red wine over the back of the bar spoon. You'll see it form a layer right on the top of the cocktail. Then garnish that with two dashes of Angostura bitters, the lemon wheel, and a brandy cherry. Now, bottoms up. You'll find this recipe, more bank call sweet mash recipes, and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com, where you'll find all the ingredients in our shop. I'll be in Venice again when you hear this, researching a book. How exciting is that? So if you live for Lush Life, make sure you head out to the bars and restaurants you love and tell them how much you love them. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leads me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and always drink responsibly. Next week? Well, I'm not sure what is happening, so check back. Until that time, bottoms up. Bottoms up.